All right, in the last video, we kind of introduced this idea of the sampling distribution. And really the main takeaway for the last video is when you were in chapter three, you answered a lot of questions. Um, and some of the questions you saw in 3.1 were just about a single observation. So for example, what is the probability that one randomly selected pepperoni pizza has more than 20 pepperonis on it? Yeah, that's a question that deals with something called the parent distribution, although we didn't call it that at the time. And it's what you learned how to do in 3.1. In 4.1, the question's very different. Instead of being about one pepperoni pizza, the question is going to be about a sample of some number of pepperoni pizzas, or specifically the average of that sample. So in chapter three, the questions might be about one observation. In chapter four, the questions about the sample average. We have a symbol for the sample average, right? The sample average is X bar. We haven't seen that since 1.6, but it's true that when you have a sample, N represents the number of observations in that sample, and X bar represents the average of that sample. Not to be confused with mu, the population average, X bar is the sample average. At any rate, when your questions are about the sample average, which we hadn't seen up until this chapter, chapter four, you need a new distribution if you wanna answer questions about it. And that distribution is what's called the sampling distribution. Anytime your question is about the average of some number of pepperoni or some number of observations, pepperoni pizzas in this example, we're going to be dealing with the sampling distribution. And what we saw last video is the sampling distribution and the parent distribution, they're related. Right? There's a lot of connections between the two. Um, this in black is a picture of a parent distribution, and this in blue is a picture of the sampling distribution for five observations that corresponds with it. And this thing in black looks bell-shaped symmetric. This thing in blue does as well. Turns out they're both normal distributions. More on that soon. This one in black, we said, had a mean of 16 and a standard deviation of 5. This one in blue also has a mean of 16, but it doesn't have a standard deviation of 5. In this video, I want to talk about three aspects of this distribution in blue. And those three aspects will be very important going forward in this class. Those three things are the shape, the center, and the spread of the distribution. We've already done those, maybe not explicitly, but we've already talked about those things for the parent distribution. The shape in every single question 3.1 was normal. And the reason it was normal was by assumption. It told you in the problem that the parent distribution was normally distributed. It had to. Every single problem it said that. You probably got to the point where you didn't even notice that anymore. It's like, yeah, it's in every problem. I don't really use that. I mean, I guess that's telling me why I can draw the distribution this way. But fine, you just took it for granted after a while. But it's true, every single shape was normal because it told you that it was normal in the problem. The center was always given by mu. Mu is the population average. And the spread was always given by sigma. And sigma is the population standard deviation. And the questions were always about one observation. Uh, sometimes it was denoted as an x. I told you that I'm not gonna ask you questions this way, but mathematically you could state what is the probability that one pizza has more than 20 pepperonis on it this way. You could say, what's the probability that X is greater than 20? X represents one observation. In chapter four, these aren't what the questions are going to look like. And the reason why is the questions are not about one observation. They're about the sample average. They're about the average of some number of observations. The chapter four questions, I'm not going to ask them this way, but you'll see it denoted this way in the homework, might be what is the probability that X bar is greater than 20? Not X, but X bar. I don't want to know what's the probability that one pizza has more than 20 pepperonis on it. I want to know what is the probability that if I collect a sample, five observations in this case and observations generally, what's the probability that the average of that sample is greater than 20? And when you see that, you have to recognize that it's a sampling distribution question. It's a chapter four question. Your first question might be, okay, what about the shape? I mean, you drew it as a normal here. Turns out it is still normal. Um, but that deserves some explanation because it does not tell me in the problem that it's normal. And you're like, yeah, it does. It says it right here. Nah, this is talking about the parent distribution. This is all information about the parent distribution, not the sampling distribution. The sampling distribution is normal when the parent distribution is normal, but we have to explain why. And then maybe you wonder, what if the parent distribution is not normal? What if it were left skewed or right skewed or something? Does that mean the sampling distribution is left skewed or right skewed? And the answer is no. So we'll have to talk a lot more about the shape of the sampling distribution. But before I do, I want to talk a little bit about the center and the spread of the sampling distribution. 
the center of the sampling distribution. It's the same as it was here. Right? This 16 here is the same as this 16 here. But I don't want to just write it's mu again because mu represents the center of the parent distribution. So really what I need is a new symbol over here that'll be something that will denote to the reader that I'm talking about the population average, but not of the sampling distribution. Sorry, not of the parent distribution, but of the sampling distribution. And there is such a symbol. It's a mu with a little x bar in the subscript. And that might look really weird, but I'd argue that makes more sense than maybe you'd think. This is saying the population average of all the different x bars. Right? Each observation over here is an x bar. An x bar is made up of five pizzas. This is saying the population average of averages of five. If you go back over here to this applet, the center of this distribution is the population average, but not the population average of one pizza, the population average of samples of five. Right? Imagine you took all the pizzas and you grouped them into groups of five. Each group of five now represents one observation, even though it has five pizzas. And the population average of those observations, each containing five pizzas, is really what the center is here. So, when we talk about the center of the sampling distribution, we're gonna use the symbol mu with a little x bar in the subscript. Similarly, when we talk about the spread of the sampling distribution, we're not gonna use the symbol sigma, the population standard deviation, because this is the spread of the parent distribution. We want something that denotes it's still the population standard deviation, but not of one observation of my sample averages. So the center and the spread when you're in chapter four, will not be mu and sigma anymore. There'll be mu sub x bar is how you say that, sub because it's down in the subscript, mu sub x bar, and sigma sub x bar. It's the mu of the x bars and the sigma of the x bars. Not super important that you're perfect on all of these symbols, but I think if you get the hang of these symbols, it'll help you remember what we're doing. These symbols make sense. Somebody chose this for a reason the population average of the sample averages. And that takes a while to wrap your head around, the average of the averages. Like that's confusing, don't get me wrong. But when you can get that to make sense, this symbol will make sense. And if you understand this symbol, it might help you understand the concepts to begin with. Anyways, in every single chapter four question, mu and sigma will be given to you. And you're like, oh, you screwed up. You said mu and sigma, but you meant mu sub x bar and sigma sub x bar. No, I didn't. In every chapter four question, mu and sigma will be given to you. Remember, in this sampling distribution question, I was told about the parent distribution. This mean is referring to individual pizzas. This standard deviation is referring to individual pizzas. That's not what I want down here. I want the mean and the standard deviation referring to sample averages. There's a formula for this and a formula for this, and you need to memorize those formulas. Because you need to know the center and the spread of this distribution so that you could put in the center and the spread as the third and fourth arguments into normal CDF so you can answer these questions. So what I wanna do is give you a formula here and a formula here, then talk a little bit more about why the shape is normal and then call it a video. So two formulas to memorize, that's the bad news. Want some good news? This first formula is the easiest formula you've ever seen in your life. Mu sub x bar, it's always just mu. At the center of the sampling distribution, 16 in this example, is always just the same as the center of the parent distribution. The reason I knew this was 16 is because this was 16. The applet confirms as much, right? The average up here was 16, the average down here was 16. The mean is the exact same in both of these. And that kind of makes sense. I mean, you can memorize that if you want, but it sort of makes sense. If you think about the average pizza has 16 pepperonis on it, and I ask you the question, how many pepperonis on average should I expect there to be in my sample of five pizzas? How many pepperonis on each pizza in my sample of five? There's no reason to think that it should be more than 16 or less than 16. If each individual pizza I expect to have 16, then I expect five 16, so I expect the average to be 16. It won't always be 16, just like a single pizza won't always have 16 pepperonis on it but the population average of the sample averages should just be the exact same as the population average of the individual pizzas. So in this example, uh, my mu sub x bar was equal to 16, which is why I put in a 16 right here. You're like, okay, that's dumb. I feel like you're wasting my time, but fine. I'll listen a little bit longer, but you're running out of, I'm running out of patience for you. Um, okay, maybe I can explain why I'm writing these as formulas. This one's not just sigma. 
Sigma sub X bar is not the same as Sigma. And that makes sense, right? If you look up here, maybe you noticed that the blue distribution is more crunched in. The black distribution is more spread out, right? It's entirely possible. I'd expect to see some pizzas that have more than 20 pepperonis on them, right? That happened when I animated this thing, right? Oh, of course it doesn't happen my first try, but maybe I can find one. That's pretty good. See if I can get a high. Well, there we go. This guy. It's had a bunch of pepperonis, I don't know, 23, 24, something like that. It happens. It happens all the time with individual pizzas. But having a sample average this high, having a blue box way over here is really unlikely. And the reason why is because, yeah, you might get lucky and have one pizza with a lot of pepperonis on it, but you still have to think about the average with four more pizzas. And those pizzas, you're probably not so lucky. Right? We'd expect these guys to have 16. Maybe some have less than 16. And the average of these observations is going to end up falling closer to 16 than the individual pizzas will. What I'm saying is the standard deviation down here is smaller than the standard deviation up here. And you're like, yeah, just point at the numbers. This says 2.24. This says 5. I know that 2.24 is less than 5. That's true. But what if this weren't pizzas? And what if there weren't 5 observations? And what if the standard deviation weren't 5? Like, What if we changed everything up? Can you give me a general formula that will always tell me sigma sub x bar so that I know what to put in this box right here so that I can answer this question? If what I'm given is sigma, the population standard deviation for an individual observation. In every single problem, they're going to give you mu and sigma. And you need to come up with mu sub x bar and sigma sub x bar. This one's easy. This one's a little bit harder. There's a formula. Without further ado... Here's your formula. It's sigma divided by the square root of n. So in this specific example, sigma was 5, and n was also 5 for different reasons. Right, This right here told me that sigma was equal to 5. This right here told me mu was equal to 16 while we're at it. And this right here is what told me that n was equal to 5. So what we're going to get in the habit of doing for chapter 4.1 questions is you'll read through the problem and you'll start labeling things. And that's why being comfortable with these symbols is really useful. You'll be able to read this English and tell that mu is 16, sigma is 5, and n is 5. Because if you have mu, sigma, and n, you have everything that you need for the formulas for mu sub x bar and sigma sub x bar. And then you can go plugging those into the normal CDF function and be done with the problem. What I'm saying is figure out what 5 divided by the square root of 5 is equal to and put that into your calculator for the last argument into normal CDF. You might wonder what 5 divided by square root of 5 is equal to. Let me do it for you. 5 divided by square root symbol is up above the x squared key. So it says x squared right here. Above it is a radical. Hit second and then x squared and you get a little radical symbol. 5 divided by the square root of 5. It's about 2.24 if I round it to two decimal places. Hey, wait a minute. That sounds familiar. All right, 2.24. Right? It wasn't a coincidence that this was 2.24. This came from a formula. I just didn't know the formula at the time. Sorry about the dog barking in the background. The formula is this guy. And now that we know the formula, we can always predict the spread for the sampling distribution, and we can always answer these questions. Uh, one comment there. This formula makes sense. Not to you. It shouldn't make sense to you because we didn't calculate standard deviations by hand. We just we did one variable statistics in our calculator to calculate these guys. But if you understood the formula for standard deviations, you'd see why it makes some sense to divide by the square root of n here. But since we don't do that by hand, I can't really explain to you why this formula makes sense. You just have to trust me that this is the right formula that you're going to be using for sigma sub x bar. One more comment. Let's finish this problem up. If I hit second and then variables to get into the distribution menu, and select normal CDF. My lower bound is still 20. My upper bound is a bunch of nines. Here's where it gets confusing. My calculator asks me for mu and sigma. Trust me, it doesn't want mu and sigma. It wants the center and the spread. That wasn't a big deal back in 3.1 because mu and sigma were the center and spread respectively. But now that it's not, this is confusing. It doesn't want mu, it wants the center. The center is 16, not because mu is 16, but because mu sub x bar is 16. And yeah, mu sub x bar is always the same as mu. So you're like, you're making a big deal out of nothing. No, I'm not, because here it wants the spread, and the spread is not 5. It's 5 divided by the square root of n. So 5 divided by the square root 
of n, which is also five in this specific case. You're like, wasn't that just 2.24? Why don't you type in 2.24? I don't want to round the inputs into my calculator because that might throw the output off by more than the tolerance allowed in the homework. So it's a good idea to leave this as an expression, five divided by the square root of five. You're like, didn't you mean to close those parentheses? Turns out you don't even have to. Your calculator figures it out for you. You're like, I don't have a fancy calculator like you where it asks me for those four things on four different lines. That's okay. Normal CDF, there's my 20, comma. There's my upper bound, 9999, comma. There's my center, 16. And here's my spread, five divided by the square root of five. You can put expressions into functions in your calculator and it'll figure it out for you. Here's my answer, 3.68%. You're like, all right, fine, that's my answer, moving on. No, wait, slow down. That's a lot smaller than it was over here. Over here, it was 21%. Over here, it was less than 4%. Does that make sense? I think it does. If you can convince yourself of why this one is significantly smaller than this one, why that makes sense, that's some really solid understanding of the sampling distribution. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start the next video with explaining why that makes sense, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the shape, and then we'll be done with the sampling distribution.